You are listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church, located in Sandpoint, Idaho. We invite you to come and join us as we rightly divide the word of truth and encourage one another through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is our pastor and preacher, Eric Clerk. Let's open up our Bibles to the Revelation chapter 4. We have an interesting passage we are going to look at today. The different faces of these beasts. That's going to be absolutely amazing. Now, I do realize that most pastors out there are partaking in the Mass of Christ today. And they are preaching a message on something, perhaps saying how beautiful the green tree is with the sparkles and the, you know, the angel on top and this and that. And just in case any, anybody here is wondering, we, we are not going to do that. I haven't compromised with the Roman Catholic Church yet. We're not going to celebrate their Mass. We're not going to celebrate the birthday of Tammuz, which is on December 25th. We celebrated the Lord's birthday back in September, which was when he was actually born. And we celebrated it by rejoicing in the fact that God was manifested in the flesh. That's 1 Timothy 3.16. And one of the things that you'll find today is you'll find that most Christians out there, they can't tell you what the seven mysteries of God is. It's, it's, it's actually told to every single pastor in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, that they should be good stewards of the mysteries of God and teach it to their people. And we have gone through those mysteries in this church. That's the very first Sunday school we did was teaching the mysteries of God. Because I don't want to have to stand before God one day and give an account for why I didn't teach the mysteries of God. So you have all these apostates out there who are celebrating a pagan God's birthday. And yet the congregation doesn't even know what the mysteries of God are. And one of those mysteries is the mystery of godliness. And that's the one that you find in 1 Timothy 3.16, which tells us that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's what we celebrate in September, because that's when he became manifest in the flesh. And we are looking forward to his Second Advent, his return, when he takes us out of here at the rapture of the church prior to his second advent. But the greatest day is going to be the second advent. And we'll talk a little bit about the second advent today, but that is the greatest day. We don't celebrate a Lord on display at Macy's in a major with some, you know, dreadlocks or something, or at a bank in some, you know, nativity scene or on your neighbor's yard on the grass. We don't take part in that nonsense this time of the year. Our God is not a dead corpse hanging on a cross. Our God is the one who resurrected from the dead, declared to be the Son of God worth power, according to the spirit of holiness from the resurrection of the dead. Romans 1, 4. That's our God. Our God is alive. Our God is in charge. And he's coming back with many crowns on his head. And that is what we are looking forward to. So I just want to encourage you, don't feel pressured by the world because you are now a bad person because you're not taking part of this Roman Catholic nonsense. Okay, we haven't compromised yet. This church hasn't compromised. We're standing for the truth. And, and we are happy to stand for the truth. And we are happy to suffer the persecution that comes from that. Many people say that we are anti-Christmas. I'll tell you, I absolutely hate the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. I hate all their pagan festivities. I hate their idolatry. And we're not part of that. Well, idolatry is one of the things that's going to cause you to lose your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Most Christians don't know that. That's why they are blind and naked. And they're, gonna, they're spiritually blind. And that's the problem that we have today. So let's take a look. We're going to look at something here today. We're going to look at these, these four beasts around the throne of God. And it's going to be a two-part. It might even be more than that. 
because next week we're going to look at seraphim, cherubim, and also at angels. And those three things are not the same. So we'll find out next week what the differences are. I really wanted to preach on that today, but unfortunately there's so much more that we have to cover first. So let's go ahead. Let's read together verse 6 and then verse 7. Let's just do 6 and 7 today. Read for me verse 6 and 7, the Revelation chapter 4. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of life before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Did you see that? A flying eagle. The eagle flies, huh? they, their face is a little different than when they're just sitting up in a tree, right? That's what their face looked like. So what we see here is that there are four beasts and they in the midst and around the throne. And what's interesting is the Bible is going to describe to us these four beasts. And we're going to look at that next week a little bit further, but we are going to look at the four faces today because there's just something absolutely fascinating. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. These beasts, these beasts are so powerful. If you were going to compare one of these beasts, which are real, these are living creatures, these are genuine living creatures. The world today believes in this fictitious character called Santa Claus. And he has a sleigh that supposedly flies through the sky. And one of his reindeer has, is called Rudolph, and he's got a red nose, right? And they all laugh about it, and they think it's all a joke. And by the way, we posted that article on our website about Santa Claus. It's going to show you how everything about Santa Claus makes a mockery of the person and attributes of God. You may want to check it out. Now, if you were going to compare the fictitious character of Rudolph, that's a reindeer, and all the powers that he supposedly has, because after all, he has to move at something like 81 miles a second in order to fly and deliver all them presents, right? Okay, so he's going to be kind of fast and powerful, right? If you were going to compare Rudolph with one of these beasts, it would be like trying to compare the little poodle with a bloody nose with a great African mountain lion, or big African lion, I should say. That's what the comparison would be. These cherubim, these beasts, are for real. These things are genuine. These are not fictitious characters. And these things are far more powerful than anything that the devil or Satan and Santa has in their disposal. And there are four of these in front of the throne of God. You'll see next week when we look into it that Satan himself was a cherub. And that he... He, he was demoted. He was cast out. He was cast down. Okay? And so what, what we are dealing with here is very powerful beast. Now the first thing that you're going to notice is that there are four faces. Now I want to look at those faces today and I want to show you some really neat things. There's a, the face, first face is that of a lion. Do you see that? The next one is that of a calf. Then there's a face of a man. And then there's a face of a flying eagle. We got that right, right? Okay, now, watch this thing. At his first advent, the Bible gives us four counts of the Lord's first advent. Some commentators will try to spiritualize these, beasts in, these, these, these four beasts and say that they are the four Gospels. They're, they're not the four Gospels, but they have a picture of the four Gospels in them. Matthew was, was written to the Jews to present to them that the Lord Jesus Christ is their king, their Messiah. And lion is the king of all the beasts, or the wild beasts, right? So the lion represents the king. Mark was written to the Romans, and he, Mark portrays the Lord Jesus as the suffering servant. And calf is a servant animal. It's, it's like an ox. You'll see later on when we get to Ezekiel 1, it's, it's described as the face of an ox face of a calf. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an animal, domesticated animal. So we see a wild beast, the lion, that's Matthew. Then we see the domesticated animal, which is the, the calf. 
which is the suffering servant. And then Luke, Luke is written to the Greeks, and he describes the Lord Jesus as the Son of Man. And that's very interesting because the third face is that of a man, right? So we see that match. And then John, John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He presents the Lord Jesus Christ as God. God is a spirit. And so we see the eagle. The eagle is associated with that. Because in the Bible, often birds are associated with spirits. And so that is a match. Now, it's interesting when you look at that, because if I was to ask you, does a king have a genealogy? You'd say yes. And so in the book of Matthew, what you're going to find is that we find the genealogy of the king, King Lord Jesus Christ, and we see that he comes all the way from Abraham through David, and that it's perfect, 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. And you can read it. It's absolutely amazing. Do you care about the genealogy of a servant? No, you don't care where they come from. You just care about the fact that they can do the work that you give them to do, right? So we don't see a genealogy in Mark. Does a man have a genealogy? Yes. Yes. And so we see the genealogy of the son of man all the way to Adam, the first man in the book of Luke. And then does God have a genealogy? No, God always existed, right? And you see that genealogy in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that is it. There you have it. So yes, those four beasts are a perfect picture of the first advent. And now what I'm going to show you today is that these four beasts are also a perfect picture of the second advent. Likewise, as the Bible gives us four accounts of the first advent, the Bible also gives us four accounts of the second advent in the book of Revelation. We're going to look at that just now, but go over to Revelation chapter 6. I want you to see something here first. Before we look at those four accounts, I want to show you something else. And what you're going to see in those four accounts is that I believe they match those four faces perfectly also. Absolutely amazing. I'm going to show you that. Now, first of all, go to the Revelation chapter 6 and read for me verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as if were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. One of the four beasts, okay? Come and see. Now, John goes, and what does he see? Read for me verse 2. And I saw, and behold, the white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. So we see the white horse, and he that sat on had a crown. Who has a crown? The devil. The, yeah, that is actually the Antichrist, but he comes as a king, right? Kings make crowns, right? So he comes in. You see that? That matches the lion, isn't it, in a way? Yeah, you see that? Okay, now let's look at verse 3. Read for me verse 3. So now it's the second beast speaking, right? That's the calf. That's the servant, right? Look at what he tells him to see. Read for me verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So we always see in the Bible that when God punishes a nation, it is sword. And then it's followed by famine, and then comes disease. It's in that order. And this is what we see here. So first we see the Antichrist on his white horse, coming down with one crown. That's what the first beast showed. Now the second beast shows us something, and he shows us that there's going to be war on this earth, okay? Who's going to be fighting with one another? All the servants of the Antichrist, right? Okay, let's, let's go on. Read for me verse 5. Okay, let's see what, what does it say. Read for me verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. 
You know what that is? That is the wages of a man for one day's worth of labor. A man. Third beast out of the face of a man. Isn't that interesting? Okay, let's do verse 7. And let's read verse 8. What is the fourth beast? This is now the eagle. What does he reveal? Let's see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto death over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So the eagle is telling us about these last two horses there's not just one horse there's the pale horse and death they're just called death and hell and power is given unto them we'll get to that later that's really two horses but we'll get to that that hell is actually a crimson horse you'll see that in the book of zechariah fascinating stuff it's not four horsemen five horsemen of the apocalypse but we see here that it's being presented by four beasts who tells us this isn't it interesting that it almost seems like there should have been a, a, a fifth beast there to give us the other horse, but he's missing. He's not there. Put that forward on the back burner. We'll get to that later on. Okay, now I want to talk about the four accounts of the second advent. You see, the Bible tells us but that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, a, a matter should be established, right? But God gives us four accounts of his first advent, he also gives us four accounts of his second advent. Now, I've talked a little bit about this before, but I just want to show you something. The first account is Revelations chapter 5 and 6. And we're going to go to chapter 5 and 6 just now, and I'll show you something there. And then the second account is, you see the second advent again in chapters 11. Chapter 11, I should say, in verse 15. And then you see the third account in chapter 14, and then you see the fourth account in chapter 19. So in 6.15 to the end of the chapter, you see the first account. 11.15 to the end of the chapter, you see the second account. 14.15 to the end of the chapter, the third account. And 19.15 to the end of the chapter, the fourth account. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. This is not something that I read in the book or that I heard anybody else preach. This is just something that, that I see. So I'm giving you that disclaimer in case you wonder, where did he get this from? I believe that what we're going to see is, in likewise, how we can take Matthew and make that the lion, the king, and we can make Mark, the servant, the, the, the calf, and we can make Luke, the son of man, which is the face of a man, and we can take John, which is the spirit, the God, you know, he's the son of God, and make that the eagle. In likewise manner, we can make the first account, 6, 15 and downward, is going to be from the perspective of a lion. And 11.15 is going to be from the perspective of a, of a calf, or a servant. And then 14.15 is going to be from the perspective of a man. And 19.15 and is going to be from the perspective of an eagle. And I want to show it to you. I just want to prove it to you why I believe that's the case. Let me show you something. Go to, back to chapter 5. Chapter 5. We are dealing with something from the perspective of a lion. And I want to say this real quick. Let's suppose God gave us, somebody gave us, he flew, the Lord laid it on their heart, and they gave us, let's say, a million dollars, okay? And we got a, a new church building, and we bought a building, and we renovated it, and we fixed it up, and we had our grand opening, our first Sunday. Everybody's coming in, and we have the pews, and we have the walls painted, and we have the kitchen, and all that stuff. And let's suppose... Two couples were w walking in together and they were both friends. And the one lady is, hypothetically, let's say she is an interior designer. And the other lady is an artist. And the one husband is a plumber. And the other husband is, let's say, an architect or a carpenter. You know what's going to happen? Is the two husbands are going to be talking to one another about the architecture of the building and the way that it was built. The two ladies are going to be talking about the decor and the way that things are laid out and the paintings on the wall and, and this and that. You know what I'm saying? We see things that are important to us. When I go into a building like that, I, I don't care about the color of the walls and the color of the, the carpet. 
because I'm blind. But I do care about the ac acoustics in the building and the level of the noise. And if, if there's enough carpet to absorb the sound and those kind of things. We all see things through our own perceived eyes. The things that are important to us is the things that we will notice. Okay? We also know that on the opposite side of that, if somebody is, say, a thief, they can spot a thief. If somebody is a liar, they can spot a liar. Right? So it's always interesting that we receive things from our perspective. So John has been given this revelation of the first and the second and third and fourth account of the second advent. And I want to show you something here. Take a look here. Here's the first account. That's, that's Revelation 5 and 6. Look at Revelation 5. Read for me verse 5. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The first account is from the perspective of a lion. And we see a lion of the tribe of Judah mentioned there. Isn't that something? What does a lion represent? It, it represents a king, right? Okay, read for me verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So he noticed the king. That we are made kings. Isn't that something? And please, on the earth. Okay? Go over to chapter 6 for me. I'm going to just go through this quick because I want to show you something else. Also, this is really neat stuff. But go to 6. Read for me 15. There's the second advent. Take a look here. There you have. But you, one of the things that you'll notice is there's going to be the Lord's kings. And then there's also the Antichrist kings. You're going to see this. In every single one of these, you're going to see the good and the bad. But they all, the good guys, the, we are made kings, okay? The Antichrist also had kings. And you'll see it right there in the second advent. Read for me 15. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bond man, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Okay, and this is the second advent. Read for me 16 and 17, and we'll just finish out this chapter. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So the king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings, is coming. And from the perspective of a king, you see the kings. You see... Us, the servants, are kings, and you see the Antichrist servants, the kings, right? You see that. Okay, let's look at the second one. The second one is chapters 8 through 11. 7 is a parenthetical chapter, fits into chapter 6. We'll get to that later. Go for me to chapter 8. Let's take a look. Now we're dealing with a servant, the, the calf, right? A calf. What do calves eat? Grass, right? Okay. Let's take a look. This is the servants on this earth are the serfs. Remember, during the tribulation, you only got two classes. You got the, the higher class and you got the serfs. Everybody has basically become slaves, right? They've, they've, they've given away their liberties and they're all being suppressed by that one world religion, one world government over them. If you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to not be able to buy or sell and all this and that, Right? But from the perspective of a servant, from the perspective of a calf, take a look at this. Read for me verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. So a calf will take note in what he sees that the grass is burning up, right? Okay, and it's affecting the servants. Take a look here, verse 11. What, a calf drinks what? Water, right? Read for me verse 11. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And read for me verse 13. Of the 
So the servants of the Antichrist, as they were, were coming to him. It's a scene from the perspective of a servant, right? Now go to chapter 11. Let's look at the second advent part of, of this one. This is absolutely amazing to me. So now we can see the God, God servants, okay? Who's God servants on the earth during that time? The two witnesses, right, is among them. Look at verse 3. Read for me verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Okay. Drop down to 11.15, and you see there's your second advent. You see that? You can just eyeball it, right? You see that? That's when he gets many crowns, right? And now watch this thing. Go down to 11.18. That's the judgment. Take a look there. What happens to the servants of the Lord? Because it's all about from the perspective of a servant. Read for me 11.18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants and prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which so that's from the perspective of a servant, from the calf, right? Grass that's gone, water that gets bad, inhabitants of the earth, all the serves are suffering. We see God's servants, the two witnesses, and the other servants who are getting their rewards. Isn't that interesting? Okay, it gets even better. Now we get to the face of a man. Okay, let's go to chapter 13. So the next section is going to be chapters 12, 13, 14 is going to be the chapters that's going to be seen, I believe, from the perspective of a man. Okay? Take a look here. Chapter 13. Who are we dealing with here? Well, a very wicked man. The Antichrist, right? Drop down. Look at verse 18. 18 is 3 times 6. So in chapter 13, 3 times 6, what do we see there about this man? Read for me that verse. Six hundred, three score and six, and it's the number of a man. Okay. Now, remember, Luke portrayed the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, and that's why we had the face of a man. Go to chapter fourteen. Let's look at this second advent denoted here. Read for me, verse fourteen. You wouldn't believe it. What the Lord Jesus Christ is called here. Take a look. Fourteen, fourteen. He has the golden crown. That's the kingdom of God. And he's called the son of man. man. Isn't that something? And then verse 15. Read for me 15. That's the second advent. Watch this. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Trust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. There you have it, second advent, okay? Three out of three so far. Now, let's take a look. The next section is chapter 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. We see the second advent in 19, 15 also. But what, and this is going to be from the perspective of an eagle, right? An eagle is a bird. It's a fowl in the Bible, right? What do you guys think so far? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It all lines up. It all lines up, okay? Now, what is a bird in the Bible presented as? It's presented as a, a, a spirit sometimes, right? Okay, go for me to 17, chapter 17. And read for me verse 3. Seeing it from the bird's eye view. Now watch this thing. A bird is going to spot the birds, right? Go to chapter 18. Read for me verse 2. And he cried lightly with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean. 
How about that? But that's not all. Go to chapter 19. Chapter 19. Watch this thing. Go to chapter 19. Read for me verse 15 and 16. Let's look at the second advent. It's just, it's the end of a very beautiful passage in your Bible. But for the sake of time, let's just look at 15 and 16. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his side a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And there you have it, Lord of lords. He's not no longer just a king. He is Lord of lords also, right? From the perspective of a, a bird, from an eagle. But now watch this thing. This was verse 16, right? Read for me 17 and 18. From the perspective of an eagle, all the dead carcasses he's going to eat, huh? Go down. Eat, I think it's verse 20. Read for me verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, and which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Burning with brimstone. Now watch what happens to the rest of the people. Read verse 22. Look at these eagles. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Wow. Isn't it amazing? All four of those accounts of the second advent also seem to match the four faces. It's kind of neat, isn't it? We have a wonderful, amazing book. It's just incredible. Okay, now I've told you before that Revelation and Genesis falls into each other perfectly, right? Genesis 1, we see the first light. Go to Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, we see the first light. In Revelation 22, we see the last light. In Genesis chapter 2, we see the first Adam gets his light. In Revelation 21, the second last chapter from the end, we see the last Adam getting his flight. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the first mention of Satan. In Revelation 20, the third last chapter at the, from the end of the book, we see the last mention of Satan. And I've sat down one day, and I can't remember how far I went. I think I went like 10 or 12 chapters in, and I could line them all up. It's absolutely amazing how even the last chapter in your Bible lines up with the first chapter, then the second chapter with the second to the last, and the third to the third of the last, and so on. Bible is a supernatural book. Now look at chapter 1. I want to show you something. Look at verse 21. This is the fifth day of creation. I want you to see something. We're moving on now to something else that we see represented in these four faces, okay? And it's right here in the beginning of the book. It's amazing. Read for me verse 21. I want you to see the two classes of, of, of cre um, creatures that are being created here. Take a look there. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their time, and every winged fowl after his time. And God saw that it was good. Two classes there. We see the, the, the creatures in the oceans and the seas, and we see the fowl. Do you see that? Okay, let me ask you, if there's a big flood, which ones of those two will be affected? The fowl, right? The fowl. Obviously, the, the fishes are going to be okay. Okay, drop down to 24. Read for me verse 24. Look at the classes that get created here on the sixth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature at his time, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his time. And it was so. So we see three more groups. What are those three groups? There is, what's the first group? Cattle. Cattle. 
Isn't a calf a cattle? Yes. Wasn't an eagle a fowl? Yes. And the first, the first one that we saw, okay. What's the second group? The Creeping things. Creeping things. Okay. And what's the next one? Beast of the earth. Now, those are wild beasts. There's a differentiation. There's a distinction that's being made between cattle, those are domesticated animals, and the beast of the field. Well, who's the king of the beast of the field? The that's the lion. And who represents the cow? The, the, the calf. All right. And then there's one group that is still missing, and that's the face of a man, right? And we see that in verse 26. Let us make man in our image, right? So we see that group being presented. But I want you to take note that there are five groups total who, who should be the presented. There are the fowls, that's the eagle. There's the cattle, that's the calf. Then there's this group called the creeping things. Those are your lizards, your snakes, maybe your, your grasshoppers and all those things, right? Then there's the beast of the field, that's the lion. And then there's man. That's, that's five groups. There ought to be five, right? Do you see that? And one of them should be the creeping things and perhaps the amphibian animals too, like reptiles and amphibians. That will cover all of them. All of these groups, right? Okay, go to chapter 2. Take a look here. Adam gives names to, to, to these creatures, but take a look. Here's something interesting. Look which groups are covered here. 220. Read for me verse 20. To the cattle, that's the calf. Right? To the fowl, that's the eagle. The beast of the field, that's the lion. But to Adam, what was Adam? Adam means man. You are the face of a man. There's your four groups right there in Genesis 2 verse 20. One group is excluded. The creeping things. Doesn't it give you a creeping feeling? <laughs> The Bible is amazing. Okay, go, go to um, Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. They're going into the ark. The ark is about to depart. Most people are partying and dancing. It's just like the planet Earth today. Everybody is just in party mode, right? Drunk with the wine of her fornication. Right? Now, today, as we speak, people are just spiritually drunk, unawares that any moment there could be a rapture. And you don't want to be caught on your knees in front of some bell bush when the Lord calls us home. That's the last place you want to be. Now, let's take a look. Chapter 7. Read for me verse 13 and 14. Take a look at who goes on the ark. Do you see that all five kinds are going on? You have man, you have the cattle, you have the fowl, you have the creeping things, and then we also have the beast. Okay, they all go on. Okay, now take a look at something. Go to chapter 9. This is where it gets really interesting. The member around the throne... We saw that in verse 2, the Revelation 4, 2. There was this thing that had seven colors in it. What was it called? Rainbow. Uh, the rainbow, the bow, right? Now, remember I told you that the homosexuals have their own rainbow and it's only got six colors in it. It's not the same as our rainbow, right? Yeah. They, they, they don't be fooled by it. They, they've stolen the rainbow. Satan has his rainbow. It's got six colors. God's rainbow has seven colors, right? What is the rainbow a, a token of? A covenant. It's a covenant. And, and, who, and God keeps that covenant in front of him all the time. Now, who did God make that covenant with? Noah. Noah. But who else? 
Oh. And that's a Every living creature except the creeping things. Take a look. Let's start reading it. Let's read it together. Read for me eight and nine. Then the next verse. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. But they didn't mention the creepy things. How about that? We have only four classes there with whom God makes a covenant. He makes it with Noah and his family. That's man. He made it with the cattle. That's the calf. He makes it with the beasts. That's the lion, right? And the fowls, that's the eagle. But the creeping things are missing. And right now, in front of God's throne, he has four beasts. Not only does he have the rainbow that reminds him of this covenant that he made, but he has four beasts that... Each represents the class of living creature with whom God made that covenant. And there is one missing. And we're going to pick up on that next week. Now. Yeah, that's where it gets creepy. Okay. I got to hang you on a cliffhanger, right? But I want to give you a practical, quick practical application for you. When you look at those four faces, the first face you see is a lion. As a believer, you are going to be the, you are the bride of Christ, which means that in going into eternity, you are going to be royalty because you are going to be married to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Right? So we have to be ambassadors of Christ. So it's going to be four W's, okay? But the first one is going to represent your walk. How is your walk? How is your walk? I know John preached a great message on walking in the ways of the Lord, right? The way, in the ways of the Lord. But let me ask you, how is your walk? How do you represent yourself as somebody who is married and going to be married one day? To the King of Kings. Are you faithful? How would you feel about a spouse who was faithful to you the entire year and then for one hour they went and spent some time with somebody else? Do you think that spouse to be faithful? No. Now how, how would the Lord Jesus feel if, if you spent Let's suppose, most Christians today don't spend hardly any time on their knees, okay? But let's just say hypothetically, that I was was telling Julie this, I was just thinking about this, I couldn't help but think about this. Let's suppose hypothetically you spend three hours a day on your knees. In the course of a year, you're going to spend over a thousand hours on your knees. Do you think you have a good prayer life? You should. But what happens if you go and you spend one hour on your knee in front of a bale bush? Bowing yourself before that thing. Reorganizing the gifts. You know what you just did? You just blew it. It's no different than somebody who's faithful all year long and then goes and spends one hour with a prostitute. You don't think that person to be faithful, do you? Now, God calls that in the book of Jeremiah. He does say, he calls it hoarding, to go hoarding. That's what he says. He says that's why he had to write a letter of divorce to Israel. was because of that very same thing in that same passage. In Jeremiah chapter 3, you will see green tree mentioned several times. Isn't it amazing? In Jeremiah chapter 10, he's going to explain it to you. It's a green tree and it's decked with gold and silver. And we've done the study and we know that according to Ezekiel 16, decked with silver and gold means ornaments. So you put ornaments on that thing. So how, how is your walk? Are you a faithful servant? Ask yourself, how are you doing as royalty? That's the first W. Second W is, is the servant, the, 
calf, okay? That's going to be your work. How is your works? Sometimes what we find, and especially in the ministry, and in, you know, find it in the Christian life too, you sometimes think that stuff becomes mundane. It becomes repetitive. It doesn't feel like you're doing anything. You know what you feel like? You feel like one of them ox that is walking, pushing some ball in a big circle around all day, all day. And you say to yourself, why am I doing this? It doesn't feel like I'm going anywhere. I'm staying in the same location. And all I'm doing is I'm just pushing and pushing and pushing. And it gets tired after a while. What's my reward? Well, guess what that thing is doing? It's just pumping water out of a well. And it's pumping that water for other people to drink. For the other critters, right? And it also could be a mole. Maybe it's spinning a mole and they, they're milling flour, wheat into bread. So you might feel like you're not getting anything done because all you are is just a servant. But meantime, God is using you in something that is vitally important. It's just you don't see the bigger picture. You just see the ground in front of you and it doesn't feel like you're doing anything. The same thing can be said about an ox that's used for plowing a field. You know, you don't see the reward that's going to happen down the road six months from now when season comes in. All you see is you're walking on this hard dirt and it doesn't seem like you're getting anything accomplished because when you look back, and you shouldn't look back, but if you do look back, you, all you see is just a, a groove in the ground. You don't see big tomatoes and pumpkins and squash and all that stuff. You don't see that. So you feel like all you're doing is, is for nothing. But let me ask you, how is, you, is, is your works? How are you doing as a servant? Because you see, sometimes in life, that, those mundane things that you, you don't think much of is maybe you packing that diaper bag to bring the, the, the kids to, to church. Maybe it's you making sure that your family sits in church faithfully every Sunday. And sometimes it feels like you're just doing something repetitive. But meantime, what you're doing is, is you are opening up those little ears to the Word and the truth of God. And you don't see that. Because it doesn't always feel like that. And I, what I'm saying is don't go by feelings. When it, goes, when it comes to doing the works, being an ox, being a servant, Paul says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. He calls himself a servant first before he calls himself an apostle. You have to be a servant before you can do anything else for the Lord. You have to first be a servant who does whatever mundane job he gave you to do. Do it with joy because even though you may not know the fruit of it, he knows the fruit of it, right? Okay, next one is, is the space of a man. We're going to talk about witnessing. That's the W. So we go from the first one is your walk to your works to your witnessing. The souls of men. How are you doing on getting the gospel out to people? You know you have about a week left before the end of the year. And my question to you is, how many people in this last year have you given the gospel to? How many people have you invited to church? Only you and God know. But my question is to you, you've got a week left. How about you go out and you give out five gospel tracts? Or maybe ten gospel tracts? Or church invitations. You know, you think, well, that's the pastor's job. No, we are all called to witness, right? Every single one of us has received the Great Commission. And yes, not all of us are good when it comes to talking to strangers. But you can be a witness in other ways too. You can be a, the person who drives the car maybe for the person who's going to go hand out the gospel tracts. You can volunteer in some way and be a part of that ministry. How are you doing on that? And then the last one is the eagle. And that's the spirit, right? How is your worship? That's the W for that category. How is your worship? We are to worship God in spirit and truth. Is your, is your worship all based on just feelings? It feels good. It's emotional driven. Or is your worship genuine? You see, God desires true worship. In Malachi chapter 1, He tells us He doesn't want vain worship. He doesn't want worship that is just repetitive. He wants genuine worship. He wants undefiled worship. He would rather you pray to Him five minutes every single day on your knees 
and spend zero seconds in front of your knees, in front of a green tree, than spending three hours a day on your knees and then go sit, you know, five minutes in front of a green tree. He doesn't want that kind of worship. He doesn't, he tells you that your worship has to be undefiled. You cannot drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't eat from the Lord's table and from the table of devils. He tells us in his word, ye that love the Lord hate evil. You and I are commanded to abhor all appearances, abstain from all appearance of evil, and we are to abhor evil. Both of those things are in the word of God. How are you doing on that? How is your worship? Is your worship true or is it defiled? That's my question to you. That's the practical application. So as you look at those four faces of those animals, the lion is your walk. How is your walk? Remember the lion walks, right? As an ox, how is your works? As, as, as a man, how is your witnessing? And in the spirit, the, the eagle, how is your worship? You're coming to the end of the year. Think about that this week. And oh, by the way, how many of you were able to read a, a book every single day this last week? Anybody did that? Which book did you pick, England? John. Which one? John. John, yeah, that is a long book. I did Second Corinthians. It was tough. I was going for something else, but I kept pulling away from John. I'm like, okay, I'll get John. What other books did, I, did we have? Obadiah, also concerning Edom. Oh, that's good. Obadiah is a good one, yeah. And, and we, eagles. And eagles, yep. Julie, what, which one? First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Thessalonians. Galatians. The Galatians. Colossians. Colossians, that is a really excellent one. Were you able to do it, Alison? Yes, sir. Good for you. I'm proud of you. And Rebecca, which one did you do? I did Jude. Jude? And, you, and, and how did it go? Did it go well? Good. Good. I'm proud of you too. I'm proud of all of you who tried. You know, this next week, try that. Pick a book and see if you can read it. Those of you who haven't done it, I took Second Corinthians and I have to admit... Every time I read through it, I saw something new. Did you guys see something new every time you read through it? Yeah. Isn't it amazing? It's amazing because you, you read through it and you can pay as much attention as you, you can. And then you read through it another time and you see something new that you've never seen before. I mean, I literally saw stuff in Second Corinthians I'd never seen before. I was like, wow, I didn't even know that was in there. And I've studied it. It's just, it's incredible. I love it. Absolutely love it. Word of God is amazing. Next week, we're going to look at the difference between cherubim, seraphim, and angels. And you're going to see what that missing group, who represented them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are good. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for every person that's here, Lord. Please give us safety on the road, Lord, and help us come all come back next week safe. We praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening to a recording from Shepherd's Grace Baptist Church. Please visit us at www.shepherdsgrace.org for more information.